It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I'm Dennis Farrell. He's Lars Fredrickson. Here in a few minutes, we have Bobby Fish. But first, we just want to say thank you to Fightful, Sean Rossap, uh, Rob Wilkins. Thank you guys so much for producing and hosting the show for us over there. I don't know about you, Dennis. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'm loving our new home. I, I, absolutely. I, love, I love Fightful. Yes. This is, I feel like this is such a great place. I know things are onward and upwards, or upward and onwards for this Wrestling Perspective Podcast. So many beautiful things at the at, at our feet for the future. I'm sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to to to, to join in in your your voice the voice to your whatever that nice that word that big fifty cent word would be for excitement. Uh, excitement. There you go. That's perfect. There you go. We're, as you can tell now, we're doing something a little different with the show. At the beginning of every show, we're either talk about some current wrestling stuff or past wrestling stuff or fan email. If you want in on the fan email, email us at wrestlingperspective at gmail.com. Make sure your questions or opinions. We'll listen to your opinions. We'll talk about them. We've got a bunch of questions. You want to do some fan questions real quick? I'm down. Let's do this. All right. Alex B. from Tempe, Arizona wants to know who would be our 2022 wrestling MVP? Who? Man, I mean, 2022? Yep. I would probably either go MJF or I, Sami Zayn. Mm. Either one of those two. You know, I, I think that MJF is, is, is probably the he will go down in the annals of history as the great one of the greatest heels. I think not only can he bring it on the stick, but he's he's I think he's a superb wrestler and he's a great storyteller. And I think that was proven in the CM Punk uh, matches. Um, I think you know uh, as far as Sami Zayn goes, just his his wit and who he is in. The, uh, you know, but then again, you know, I would say, uh, you know, I'm just trying to think like there's so many great, you know, Diener from Violent by Design. I mean, there's, there's, I, 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 I can't just say there's one. I, but if I, okay, if there is one, I'm picking MJF. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the obvious, and I'm gonna say Roman Reigns, but. But I, on your Sami Zayn point, I I don't think I'd call him an MVP. I'd call him Scotty Pippen because he's made everybody around him MVP. I think without without Sami, the bloodline would have died out pretty quick. And I know I'm making a case of calling him an MVP, but Sami has elevated Roman Reigns to the next level. And I, I think Sami would have gotten the best supporting actor role if this was a movie award show. But uh MJF Roman Reigns for me. So yeah, I mean, I see the argument on Roman Reigns as well, and I totally get it. But I don't think you know Roman Reigns is who he is without Paul Heyman. I don't think who he is without without the Usos. I don't think who he he who he is who he is without Sami Zayn. So for me, he's more of the supporting. Even though he's playing a lead role, he's almost a supporting cast member in a lot of ways. I agree. In my opinion, in my opinion, I, I but like. Anyways. This. Thank, yeah. thank you, Alex B. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alex. Sam from Atlanta. Hey, guys, I found your show on Fightful. I'm going back to watch some of your past interviews. Dennis and Lars, what's one interview you would recommend I watch? Oh, man, I think the Kurt Angle one was great, if that's still up. I think. <laughs> that's uh, still up. <laughs> uh, Jason fucking Kindle. <laughs> you know I what? think, uh, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. I was going to say, so during that interview, he was, uh, Kurt Angle came on to uh, promote some uh, snacks he has, right? So through the, the chicken snacks, the, the chicken, chicken snacks, snacks through, so through the whole interview, Jason Kindle's like, I went out and I bought someone I knew we were having you on. They are phenomenal. I love this flavor. Lars goes out, buys it, sends a text. All of the, the flavors, all yeah. of the flavors. Sends a text to the group going, man, man, uh, Jason Kendall, former baseball player. Uh, you're right. These are phenomenal. And Jason's like, I didn't order those. I was just kissing his ass. <laughs> so but, and legit. Yeah, but legit. I really liked them. And I and I kept <laughs> ordering them. And I and I I haven't in a while just because I forgot. But um, they're actually really freaking good. The, the Sriracha ones out of this world, out of this world. I would I'd have to go with our MJF interview. Oh, that was beautiful too. That was beautiful too. Um, but you know, uh, Ruby, Ruby Soho, Soho was a great one. Um, I think that's you know, what put us on the map was Ruby Soho one. Yeah, but I mean, even um, 
you know, I, I'm kind of thinking from the from Eric Young was a great, a great. Uh, uh, we had um, Swan was another. I mean, I think there's a lot of really good ones where I feel like we got a lot of information out of these guys. And I feel like, you know, I feel like anyone you pick, I would say uh, an older one, I would go with Kurt Angle. A, a newer one, maybe, I would say. I mean, can you call Ru the Ruby so a newer one? Ah, that's two years that old now. Year. We've been doing this I know, for this is, years. I know this is insane. So, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of one of the later ones that we've done that have been Vinny Mastaro, because that, you know, the indie, indie one, or Ace Steel would have been another good one, I would say. Yeah, the 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 Steel one was very good. Uh, you know what? I liked our first Rocky Romero one we had. Oh, that was great. That was great. You know what? One from this year, Eddie Kingston. Oh, awesome. And I love Eddie Kingston. Such a great guy. Or our 300th episode with FTR. Oh, shit. That's right. I forgot. You know who, you know who we got to get? So and I don't know if they're listening. They're probably not. But I want the Briscoes on here. Yes. we. You know, I've gotten emails from people asking us to get them on. And I've been trying to, hey, Briscoes, I don't know if you have internet. But if you do, email me wrestling perspective well, at gmail.com i'll see what i can do uh josh bailey from australia lars i'm a super fan uh i'm super glad that you are doing a wrestling podcast but for the life of me i can't figure out how you found dennis <laughs> that's well, a real email the, we got wow um well actually dennis found me i and, did you know, the, 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 i mean dennis hit me up a few times saying hey i do this wrestling podcast with you know, some ex, uh, you know, professional sports players, you know, Jason Kendall, Demetri Young, uh, Darren um, D-Max. So, you know, Darren was obviously a four-time Stanley Cup winner. I'm a, I'm a hockey fan. I'm also a baseball fan. I'm Jason Kendall played with my Oakland A's. Um, so, you know, and he also had a great attitude. Even though he fucked me on the chicken snack, I still love you, Jace. But anyways... Uh, Dennis actually sent me an email and I thought, who the fuck is this guy? And then I, then I went back because I'm not really an interview kind of person. And, and, but Dennis, I'm super grateful that you did find me because here we are. How many years later now? Four? You're, you're just about. Yeah. It seems like forever now that you're stuck with me. Well, no, but I'm, if there's any guy, anybody that I'd want to be stuck with doing a podcast at you, buddy, because you're great at what you do. All right, let's do two more inner questions, and then we'll hit uh, Bobby Fish. Sounds great. Pamela from Cali wants to know, if you had to rank your favorite wrestling shows right now from worst to first, what would they be? Can I go first? Well, yes, you... please. Yes. I would put worst number five AEW. Uh, they started out so hot. I still like the product. But I need to see more out of them. I want better infrastructure. And if they were smart, they'd start raiding the uh, – what's the done guy from WWE? Uh, oh, the producer. Uh, 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 Adam? Is that his name, Adam Dunn or the teeth guy? I don't know. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, the I'd start raiding his coaching tree and stealing whatever producers you can to better your show. You have so much potential, but you're just – Kind of pissing it away, guys. Um, at number four, ah, dude, this is a tough one. I'll go SmackDown only because it's on Fridays, and I just find it hard to watch wrestling on a Friday night. Uh, I would go MLW at three. It's up and coming. I, uh, the people are nice. I love the product. Uh, I wish more eyes were on it. And I'd even put NWA at three, too. So maybe an N NWA. Uh, MLW mix right there. I would go NXT right now at two and Raw at number one because just the turnaround Raw has made under Triple H phenomenal. How about you? Well, you know, if you would have asked me this question, let's say six months ago, my worst to first, it would probably be Raw, SmackDown, and then, you know, three others. But, I, you know, I'm like you. I feel like since, since Triple H has taken the helm, it's actually watchable television and television that I can get into and get behind people, you know, get behind characters. Um, worst to first, uh, ooh, I'm going to have to probably say AEW as well. As much as I love that product and I love that show and I love that company and I really enjoyed it because it was a 
it was definitely a different, you know, option than what I was burned out on WWE so hard. But like you, I want more uh, consistency. I feel like a lot of the wrestlers that I do love in that company, you don't really see them. I, but I do enjoy the fact that MJF has such a heavy spot because I think he's the greatest heel that's happening right now. Uh, probably four, I would do uh, maybe Raw because I'm still kind of trying to catch up with it. Um, once I think Cody comes back and, you know, a lot of these guys that I, that are, that are, that, I mean, I, it seems like they're re retooling it. You know, they're, they're kind of getting their, their, their mojo back. So I'm just going to give it a four for now. Uh, three, I'm going to go impact. I, I am a regular fan of watching impact. So I'm going to put them right in the middle just because I just enjoy the show. I enjoy the wrestlers. I enjoy the commentary. Um, Speedball is one of my favorite guys. Uh, I see him a lot on the indies here. Um, number two, I'm going to go Triple A, just because I love Lucha Libre, and um, I really love what they've been doing as of recent. And it's just that promotion, you know, CMLL. I would I, that's the TV that we would get all the time. And when Triple A sort of started up, it was very hard to find, you know, Triple A shows. Um, but yeah, so any any kind of Lucha stuff. And, I, and I, I'm loving the clowns and, and uh, you know, I, I, there's so many just great talents there. Uh, number one show to watch, I'm going to probably have to say is it's a tie between, um, and, and the only reason why NWA didn't make the cut, it's just because I haven't been that consistent with NWA, but I do enjoy that product every time that I do watch it. I love Ricky Morton. I love Kerry Morton. Um, and also to go back to Impact, having Bully Ray there and, and the big pay-per-view coming up in January, I'm really excited. I'm really invested because Bully Ray is an apple and a great heel. And I, I'm a heel guy. I love the heels. Number one show, I'm probably going to have to go with, um, phew, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to have to go with SmackDown. I think it's just, I think it's always been the superior WWE TV show. Um, it's really hard for me to say, uh, you know, do you watch it that, live or do you watch it later on DVR? I watch, I am both. Okay. Because I, I'd stream. So, and that's just this week though. You have to understand like last week's SmackDown, I thought it was just a great show from start to finish. And that's why it's fresh in my mind to pick them as number one. But normally I would say like, uh, you know, I would, you know, I don't know. There's there's so many promotions. GCW is a great promotion. You know, it's hard. It's hard. And by the way, me leaving Impact off my list is not a slight to them at, at all. So I I just well, I got them. Yeah, I you got them. I know, didn't. So we're covered. And and then you have to remember that there's a lot of wrestling companies, and this is a weekly thing, Dennis. This is not a forever. I I agree because you ask us next week, things may shows may pop off, and shows may pop on. Yeah, and you picked you picked Rob just because of the re the regrouping, the revamping. So yep. as number one, and I know for a fact two months ago you would have said that wouldn't even have been in the top five. No, not at all. Uh, Kendi didn't put where he's from. So if you leave an email for us, wrestlingperspective at gmail dot com, say it three times, you'll always remember it. Kendi wants to know what is our bucket list interview of someone we've not interviewed yet. That's a good one. I would have I, to go, I'd have to go somewhere classic. And now bucket list, I'm gonna try to say somewhat attainable. Like, look, we would all love to interview The Rock, but he's not fucking talking to us. So uh bucket list maybe like a, a Stone Cold or Bret Hart, maybe, although I, Brett, just because of his you know legacy. Oh, man, so, God, maybe a Edger or Christian would be up there on my bucket list. Uh, I I put MJF back up there since we had him before his championship run two years ago now. Yeah. Uh, it was during COVID. So uh, we haven't talked to championship MJF yet. So that might be, can you re-put someone back on a bucket list? I don't even know. What about you? Well, you know, I'm going to say with the Briscoes. I want the Briscoes on here. They're one of my favorite tag teams. I remember getting hip to them around 2007. There was a, a series of DVDs called Match of the Year Candidate. And a lot of the wrestling traders 
um, you know, would make these match of the year candidates. So you'd go month by month by month. So for January, it'd send you the best matches as voted upon of January, February, and you'd have to, you know, there's, there sometimes would be seven, eight discs. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And they had a match in Japan in January of 2007. And I remember being so excited by the physicality of these guys. And they're, they're young, you know, they're shaved head, no facial hair. They look like hard, they look like the British Bulldog and Davy Boy Smith, or excuse me, and Dynamite Kid. And it's like, that's the, the, the they look like a, a, a rough around the edges punk rock version of that to me you know what i mean and that's when i really clocked them and i don't talk to, about them as much as I, I i as much as i love them i i barely very rarely talk about them maybe i don't know if that's some sort of psychological problem i'm, ha- I'm having but i want the fucking briscoes in here and what i would love the dream interview the dream freaking interview is to have the briscoes and ftr at the same time Oh, I just got a wrestling boner. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. I did. Holy cow. Ooh, just got tingly. Just thinking about that would be a phenomenal. Listen. Uh, so here we're going to throw it to Bobby fish in a second. We'll be doing these more often during our interviews uh, beforehand. So please inter- throw us questions. We want your comments. If there's a, if you have a hot wrestling take, we want to hear it so we can discuss it with you. So, Shoot us an email. We have, I went through, I cleared out because we used to, we didn't really do much in, we just interviewed and moved on. So I had a email full of uh, emails from you guys. No, I read them. I, I feel bad we didn't get to them, but that wasn't how the show structured. But now we're structuring it this way. Your emails will be read and we'll get to as many as we can. So uh, Lars, you ready for some Bobby Fish action? Let's get Bobby Fish on the horn. Good. It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I don't know if we're going to do a preamble or not this week, but uh, if so, fuck it, we're doing it again. That's Dr. Lars Fredrickson. I'm Dennis Farrell. What's going on, everybody? Lars, I'm excited. We have, and I hate to use the word tag team specialist, but (laughs) we have a guy that I've become a fan of since I started listening to his podcast. Uh, Sure, he wrestles sometimes. You may have seen him pop up on All your TV stations that have wrestling on. He's been everywhere that we want to be. This is Bobby Fish hanging out with us today, Bob. Hi. Can I call you Bob? Are we that good of friends? Yeah, whatever, whatever. Listen, I've definitely been called worse than Bob. I've been called worse than uh, tag team specialists. So we're still uh, above board in in my opinion here. Wait. Well, I think he's he's probably... He's probably the only wrestler that you've seen in every promotion in the last year. Yeah. I, he's, yeah. He's, he may he, be working harder than I am. Well, I've that's made kind my of, rounds. That's kind of what my <laughs> point was. I mean, you know, I feel like you not only is he a tag team specialist, but he can get in there with anybody and do his thing. So, but then again, Bobby Fish, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for making it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Uh, yeah. Kind words. We did not mean a single one of them. I'm going to be honest <laughs> with you. There's a script, but Lars sends me every week. I have to read off and, you know, sure. now I have to call him doctor every week. I, I don't get it. He just right. wants to be like Isaac Yankum now. Right. Well, birds of a feather Isaac, because yeah. I'm the most, I'm the most disingenuous person you're uh, <laughs> ever going to come across. So oh, <laughs> this would be a great show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just <so> all bullshit. <laughs> You know, I, I, I want to start out the question here. And uh, now us as wrestling fans, we have this preconceived notion that if someone was in NXT when Triple H was there, they're automatically Triple H's guys. You kind of fall under that uh, regime of you were there when he was there. You guys were probably the big money maker with Undisputed Error. Uh, the regime changes over. I listen to your podcast. You guys make a little joke here and there on your podcast about Triple H calling you. But come on, Bobby, talk to me here. Uh, are you a Triple H guy? Would you call yourself a Triple H guy? Is there a chance like you may be expecting a call from Triple H since he's kind of bringing back some of his favorites? What Are you a Triple H favorite? 
I will say that during our time there, I would definitely consider our consider all of us Triple H guys. Um, and not that we were a Triple H creation, but we had his blessing in order to move forward um, as the group that we were. Um, I think he recognized something that other people, um, you know, for whatever reason, failed to see and, and the value in us as a group, because legitimately we were four guys. Um, I mean, it started out as three, but eventually they added Roddy and, and Roddy would have been the only other person that could have been added under the umbrella of the company. Um, but I think he just saw like this genuine friendship between the four of us and was like, well, shit, I'm going to put that on screen. And it, to be honest, I, I don't know why nobody else saw that before it. Um, but yeah, he was smart enough to see that and, uh, and run with it. And, um, you know, we were blessed to, um, to have the run we had there. And to be, you know, I'm a huge fan of uh, like the Crockett years and the war games and all that stuff. That's the stuff that when I was a kid, you know, Dusty and uh, that stuff really hooked me. So to think that later in my professional life, I would get into pro wrestling and with three of my best friends be in a group that would at times share sentence space with the four horsemen and then be in the uh this generation's edition of the war games in the first four like i don't know it's kind of still surreal you know you mentioned the undispu uh, undisputed uh in the original three guys and you know obviously the business changes and you guys end up at, a, at the same company different company and now you got two guys that are basically injured and I don't even, are you, are you even working for AEW anymore? And no. So, I mean, so after all this goes down at the beginning there, when you guys sort of reunited there, was it, did it feel a little bit different in the sense that maybe you had uh, more freedom to express, maybe, maybe build what you guys really wanted to, maybe there was, you know, no ties, you know, what was your experience there having you three there? and uh sort of a, a new a new uh new canvas so to speak um i felt like when we were in nxt we felt like we were able to to cut the promos and say what we wanted to say basically we were you know we got outlines and like a bullet point sort of thing but but never did hunter um or the other writers um joe bel castro was the head writer then at the time and and uh, we worked very closely with him and and it was always kind of the same thing. Um, and the production people joked about, you know, like uh, their one take UE, you know, because literally backstage stuff took us one to two takes because, you know, it was like locker room talk. It was like the boys just bullshitting after a game of some kind or whatever. Um, so I don't know that we felt any, any new freedom because we never felt handcuffed prior you know even with with wwe which obviously at at times can can be criticized for for being overproduced and, and micromanaged um i we didn't get a lot of that we really didn't and in nxt where we were i think we were um uh, you know we we were uh, i'll go back to the first question uh, yeah we were we were, i consider us hunters guys you know and we did uh like I played sports through most of my life. And, um, you know, there's certain coaches I've played for that, like I, I played for my own, uh, success, but I wanted their approval as well. And I, I would dare to say that like Hunter was kind of that with us there because we knew he took pride in, um, in what he had with us and we took pride this, the same way. I've I've watched you change over the years. I I you know I was a Ring of Honor guy. Watched you in Ring of Honor. I went back and watched some of your old uh, pro wrestling Noah stuff. You you leave NXT. What in your mind was the difference between pre WWE Bobby Fish and post WWE Bobby Fish, and maybe how you wrestled or approached the business? Um, I think uh, pre. Bobby Fish, um, 
especially like it, you bring up Noah. Um, I knew that I wanted a heavy martial arts influence there, but I, w at my time around the time frame of Noah, I didn't necessarily know how to include that, how to like weave it into the pro wrestling. Um, eventually ring of honor new japan like right before going to nxt i felt like i was i was figuring that out and then once uh with nxt i felt like i i really had that had that figured out um but being in the group um i played a part you know it was like being in a movie and um you know, you, you don't get a role in Top Gun and go, oh, no, 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 Tom Cruise needs to step aside. I, I'm Maverick, you know. So there were certain things that I think I got very comfortable with in my Ring of Honor and New Japan run that um, I kind of, you know, parked or put on the back burner um, because that's not who I was asked to be in the Undisputed Era. And um, so then leaving NXT, um, I really got a chance to like sink my teeth back into, hey, what is this, what does this martial arts influenced thing look like, um, especially as a, a singles competitor? Because, you know, with uh, NXT, we were tons of tag team, tons of multi-man, tons of, you um, you know, Cole would have a, a, a world title match and we would interfere or we would, you know, Kyle and I would run in, hit the double team, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it, I really felt like I got an opportunity to figure some stuff out. And uh, and that was so much fun. Well, you know, you mentioned Noah, you mentioned ROH, you mentioned, you know, you've been, like I said, jokingly, you know, pretty much at every company. When you got into AEW and you and you came there for the first time, I mean, it's it's it it was it's definitely got that indie vibe to it, and it's sure. also got you know, and then there's levels of professionalism and every, every anywhere you go and mm -hmm. unprofessionalism. Did you feel like you fit in more with that kind of style, or did you feel do or do you, when you're looking back maybe that maybe the NXT version of Bobby Fish or the Japanese version of Bobby Fish or whatever it was was more. I know we all grow and mature and I get that. And I know this is kind of a stupid question, but where do you feel like you fit the most? How about that? Um, besides, I, the, besides the obvious answer, which is anywhere. Like, give me, <laughs> like you know. Yeah. So we'll preface this with anywhere. Um, I feel like, uh, I, I feel like if, if given the choice, I, I, I do perform better with a little bit more uh, structure, mm -hmm. but uh, not handcuffs. And I feel like um, there was a, a good portion of time in the NXT run where we, we had that. We had enough structure, but not so much to where it was a problem. Um, but that wasn't the entire run. Um, and uh, then with AEW, uh, there were probably times where I would have liked a little bit more direction. Um, and I think that there's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. And I don't know that either company um, or any company gets it right 100% of the time. Um, obviously, that's the goal. Um, and I think there was a time in NXT for a good period of time where we were clicking on the cylinders that we should have been. Um, and then I, I feel like with AEW, especially with Adam and, and Kyle, once we were there and uh, history that we had with, let's say like the Bucks. And I mean, you could even roll like um, the Briscoes. And th there was a lot of, I think, money on the table um, that I hoped we would we would visit. And um, things just didn't go that way. You know, maybe building off this question, you are closely tied to Kyle O'Reilly. You, you both uh, have come up together, best friends. Uh, he goes out with the injury. Your contract isn't renewed. Uh, do, do you feel like – I'm not even asked that question, but do you feel like when he comes back, or if he comes back, that – 
there's there's a reunion to be made at a major company somewhere else that maybe you're just going to bide, bide your time, find a company, hang out there. But when, when O'Reilly comes back, maybe it's reunited and it feels so good. Um, I, I think in a lot of fans eyes, that's the version of him and I, um, you know, whether you, for lack of a better term, red dragon or undisputed era, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that people, there are people that enjoy that quite a bit. Um, I don't have a, you know, I, I don't have a, a crystal ball, obviously, um, and what I've learned in the business, especially the last few years is that like, man, anything, anything is possible. Um, you know, I didn't expect necessarily my release from NXT and then, um, I didn't necessarily expect, uh, the AEW thing to come about. And, and even in the fashion that it did, it was really kind of neat the way Tony, uh, you know, brought me in and, and that was different. So, I just say neat. That was kind of neat. Like, <laughs> wait, yeah. Now I have a, to ask you to, to expand on that because yeah. I I don't read the news. I'm not a news. Okay. Guy. So when you say neat, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, there's got to be a story here. Like, did you guys have lobster together and there's kind of like dinner <laughs> and he's blowing out the candles and you get drug out of a room? How's it work? What's neat? <laughs> no, uh, not not that kind of neat. Um, so it was, uh, <laughs> cause that, cause that is a particular type of meat. <laughs> yeah. That would be kind of like a, a Tinder sort of meat <laughs> or, uh, a, a mafia hit. Yeah. Or that <laughs> right. walking first, didn't he? <laughs> um, we're all right. We're all right. Oh, Bobby Fish. <laughs> oh. Who knew? Who knew? Uh, yeah. So uh, there, it was attached to like a, a tweet and uh, Sammy Guevara had just won um, one of the titles there. And then uh, I was not affiliated with any company at the moment. And um, so I tweeted something and then that was kind of how it came to be. And then I came in through the, I believe they were calling it the forbidden door. Um and yeah, it was just kind of a, an outside the box sort of way to debut. And, uh, and I was down for that. Like that was anything different, you know, and to varying degrees of success that that Forbidden Door thing has, has been, um, but it's all subjective. So anytime that you're going to do something that's different, um, yeah, I'm, I'm up for at least trying it. And uh, that I thought was was really uh, cool or neat, <laughs> whatever you want to uh, tag it. Um, but yeah, to come in that way was uh, was interesting, and uh, and I enjoyed it. Over the years, I think we've seen the style of wrestling change, and you know, it seems like, in my opinion, and it's maybe a, a not uh, maybe it's a popular opinion, unpopular opinion. Like Dennis, I, I could give two fucks about dirt sheets and things like that but um i feel like a lot of the storytelling aspect is sometimes lost and it becomes more of a a theatrical show um i know that you're a wrestling fan um what do you try to bring to the ring with you as far as the psychology or the storytelling what's more important to you is it the athleticism or the storytelling psychology part of it Again, I think there's a sweet spot in the middle. And I think that the matches that we, uh, you know, a, a lot of people tend to enjoy the most are the ones with a good balance of the two. Um, I think sometimes, you know, um, pro wrestling is very guilty of overcomplicating things and trying to tell a story that is too nuanced. And then that loses the audience, you know, anything that that is too nuanced is just it's going to be a difficult sell. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, bookers or creative people, they just they try to get too cute. And uh, at the end of the day, we don't need to reinvent the wheel that's been said. Um, I just from a personal standpoint, I've always been um keen to like the technical side of things 
Um, and, uh, I, I think that you, you get to a point in your wrestling development where you, you learn enough of the foundation and the basics and, and you hope that it, it's good that you've been taught by somebody who knows what they're doing. And then it's up to you to start adding your flavor. And, uh, like I said before, my flavor in that way was martial arts. And it's because that's what I, I started doing that when I was eight years old. So like, that was always very technical and that's just kind of the way that I, I lean, I put quite a bit of uh, importance on that because that's, I, you know, that's my paintbrush. Uh, that's my influence on, on my work, I suppose. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's apples and oranges. I think it's different things for different people. Um, I think and that that's the stuff too, that makes it really cool. And that's what pro wrestling you know, you get like uh, the Young Bucks in a match with Kyle and myself. And what makes us so different is also kind of what makes it work. So it wouldn't make sense if we were both out there trying to do the same things, you know. Um, it's kind of the way I see like uh, mixed martial arts nowadays, like you got to check all the boxes. It's, there's no, it's not the world of specialists anymore. Like everybody does everything so well where with pro wrestling, I think sometimes we veer into that lane and, you know, not to say that a, a big guy can't do a moonsault because obviously they can, but sometimes I think when everybody's checking all the boxes, all the matches look the same. So it's like, you know, that's the beauty of pro wrestling because we control some of these variables. You don't have to check all the boxes. So have your style, stay closer to your style so that your style clashes or blends well with the next style, you know, depending upon your opponent, et cetera, or your partner, blah, blah, blah. And I, I think that somewhere in pro wrestling, that's one of the things we've lost that's really been detrimental to its... Um, it's overall uh, product. One of my favorite things about you is kind of like me. I grew up on WCW, NWA. War Games was always my favorite match, and I still will go back and watch them. As a fan, a student, being able to participate in a handful of them, do you or can you compare your War Games work to the War Games of the past? Have you tried? Do you go back and watch them? Uh, I don't believe in a grading system, but do you feel like you, Bobby Fish, did it justice being a student of that? Um, I, I'm pretty proud of of the War Games matches that we did. Um, we were the first, um, you know, coming back for this generation and with NXT, and and none of us, you know, really knew what the fuck we were doing on that first one. But I felt like we got something. Uh, halfway decent and and we got better with each one and each one had a little bit more story to it um the fourth was very story heavy with pat mcafee and and uh cole and um yeah i feel like we had an opportunity to um learn from mistakes get better at it you know plan better things be a little bit more um strategic without losing the organic feel of you know classic pro wrestling um if if i'm being honest and i look back at like some of those war games that i you know the vhs tapes that i wore out as a kid <laughs> um when i watch some of those um I think from a technical standpoint it's a, you you can see just the business is just different then and um there was a lot more um, organic feel to those matches, uh, good and bad. Um, so I think that that's the biggest difference between the two is you really see that the business is just handled in a different way now as opposed to what it was then. Um, but I think they, they all have their own um, pros and cons and, uh, and merit certainly. Um, at the war games, just an awesome, uh, experiment. <laughs> Very you know, when successful. I think of, when I think about those NXT, you know, they, and they're grabbing a lot from those WCW pay-per-views, Halloween Havoc, these whole things, war games, stuff like that. And, you know, you had a guy back there, uh, Regal was back there with you 
you know, yeah. and he's such a he's such a great mind. And every time that me and him talk, we talk for hours about yeah. so many different things. But, you know, do you feel like who's bringing those ideas to bring those types of events back? I mean, for, I mean, was it like somebody sits around? Did you know who? I mean, because you have, you know, you have so many greats back there. You mentioned, you know, you got Regal, you got Triple H, you got Shawn Michaels. It's, yeah. You know, it must have been like such a great learning curve for you to have all those people around you. Oh, it was it was awesome. And I, I think the three that you just named uh, right now are are probably those are the three that like I've always assumed were responsible for bringing those ideas uh, to life. Um, I always appreciated that fact with the, the three of them, because that, like I said, was stuff that I grew up on. So um, to be exposed to that, uh, I guess we'll call it like a think tank. Um, I, you know, I can't put a value on that when it comes to professional wrestling and, and being at NXT, I, I remember the first like two weeks that the four of us, we were moved into Sean's class and uh, we would do film study and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I had to remind myself that first couple of weeks to stop getting in my own head and just thinking like, holy shit, that's Shawn Michaels, <laughs> you know, and actually listen to the valuable information that was coming out of the man's mouth because, um, yeah, yeah, like you're sitting in the room and there, there was a couple of times when like Nash and Scott Hall had uh, come to to say hello and, and X-Pac and here we are sitting in a room with uh with the three of them and, and Sean only one missing was Hunter and we're watching, you know, whatever. And they're commenting on it. And it's just to be a fly on the wall in those scenarios. Like, again, just, uh, just stuff that I'm probably not ever going to be cool enough for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm sitting here listening. I'm like, dude, I don't know if I could have, I mean, this isn't my question, but it's a question, but come on. I mean, <laughs> They have a certain level of coolness. Can you fan out in front of them as a professional? Do you have to pretend to be an equal? I mean, because <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I was sitting in a class. I do a podcast with Lars, and I try every week not to fan out with him on the podcast. But, yeah. but I mean, do you allow yourself a little bit of like, you're Shawn Michaels? Can I tell you and just do that kind of thing with them? Um. I, I think the, you know, in the beginning, um, but then eventually you spend so much time with these people that uh, as um, inconceivable as it, it seems at one point, um, it happens like it like humanizes. Um, and then you have um, similar likes or, or whatnot, like um, Sean was always like keen to, to, talk with me about MMA and uh, those were always fun conversations and then because of both of our um, life experiences you you have the unique situation of like being fans of MMA but at the same time um, being in pro wrestling so there's an interesting sort of transfer of those things and so like some of our conversations would go that way and there were things that Sean could understand that I felt like I would share with other people and they just weren't able to bridge the gap um but to have those kind of conversations yeah with uh <laughs> with the showstopper um or sometimes to look at your cell phone and see like oh Sean Michaels is texting me <laughs> Like, you know, again, the, the whatever the 15, 16 year old me is not uh, not believing this or even well, to, you... to call Triple H my boss. Like, it's weird. Yeah, I, you know, I, I as a fan, it must be pretty trippy. You know, what I it mean? is. Yeah, I can only imagine, Um, you know, you're obviously, you know, back on the independent circuit and yeah. you're not working for a major company at the moment. What led to the departure of you and AEW, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, we just couldn't agree on numbers. Um, numbers when, when, so after I got released, um, like literally right around the corner of that, I, I had some family stuff that came up that was uh, very, you know, just, just uh, life stuff. Life happens, right? Yeah. And um, so at that time, 
when the AEW option came to be, um, I wasn't in great uh, headspace and uh, had a new house. Uh, we were planning a wedding and, um, you know, the idea of another contract uh, was safe and that provided a certain amount of security. So um, I probably jumped the gun or, you know, I don't know how to phrase it, but um, just uh, I made sure that it was only a year. I did not want to do any more than a year um, for the numbers that we were talking. And uh, then in, at the end of that year, the ink, because I felt like, okay, I will take this year and I'll show you that you will uh, want to pay me more. <clears throat> and uh, we just didn't see things the same way. And uh, so it became, it got to that point where it was like, okay, we're not really even starting close to where we need to start to. So um, my agent and I were just like, okay. Uh, he, he asked me at one point, like, that, well, this is the number they're starting at. And what do you, and I said, well, let's just walk away. So that's what we did. Way different from our negotiations where we just signed you to a three-year contract. So unfortunately, you're stuck here now. No option. <laughs> Sorry, and, no, option. And, and no security. Zero. Yeah. security in Zero. You yeah. actually owe us money. That's how <laughs> yeah. crappy this contract is. Uh, uh, so I, I give you my PayPal at the end of the show. but It's uh, the holiday <laughs> season. You know, give to others. Do you still love wrestling? Because the business, and we talk to so many people where the business of wrestling, they it saturates their love of it as a kid. And yeah. there's so much wrestling, you can't catch it all. And I get that being a wrestler, you're probably not even watching your own product because you're running, you're coming home, you're being a father, you're maintaining the mustache. That's a full-time <laughs> job in itself. It but do you yeah. still love wrestling? Well, I got to be honest, I got a little bit of a cheat code. My, uh, my wife teaches uh, barbering at uh, the state college here. So she helps. If it were not for her, I probably would not be able to, to maintain the grooming uh, the way that I do. Um, I do still watch some wrestling. A, a good portion of that right now is our 10 uh, year old here is uh, she, she likes to catch NXT and AEW and Raw, and it's something that I can watch with her. So I watch a lot of that stuff kind of passively. Um, I don't, I don't pay as close attention to it as as I used to, um, because again, I think I think it's good to have a little bit of the separation. There's times that I still love wrestling for sure. Um, there's times I'm reminded while doing it. Uh, oh man. Yeah, I do love this. Um, and then there's the other parts of it that, you know, you're kind of like after 20 years, like, well, I could do without this, <laughs> but I, there's, you know, yeah, I, I would say overall, I still love it. I still love it, but there's other things I, I think I, I want to do. And, um, you know, like I just did a boxing match in Dubai and it, it very much fell in my lap. But prior to that, I was going to do another amateur kickboxing fight. Uh, I was working on putting that together anyway. And it was more just, I feel like um, I just had the itch to compete again in whatever that is. And, you know, for me, between wrestling, pro wrestling, and then uh, legitimate sport, whether it was football or kickboxing or whatever, there's this single minded sort of uh, focus that you have when you're competing. And it's just like, I'm going out there to beat you. And you're going to try to beat me where in pro wrestling, the anxiety that I get is because we're spinning plates. And we're spinning multiple plates at one time. And because we control certain variables, you're expected to spin plates and then have five or six added because the top rope breaks or because the referee takes a bump or, you know, whatever. So that's the anxiety I feel um, in my occupation. And, and sometimes I just, you know, it, it really doing that fight in Dubai felt really good to know like, okay, I trained to do this one thing. And I'm going to go out tonight and I'm, I'm going to try my best to do that. And he's going to try his best to do that too. 
as opposed to all of the plates that we spin in pro wrestling. Did you win? I did. Yes, sir. Second round. Um, that was my next TKO. question. Yeah. Thanks for. <laughs> well, for uh, I, well, we can, we, you know what, Dennis looks like there's money to be made. Me and you <laughs> fucking Dubai. Dubai. Boxy match. No, just belly, <laughs> belly bumping. <laughs> pillow fight there's pillow no fight. way i'm fighting a guy with a face tattoo i'm gonna be honest with you right now you will beat my ass just on looks <laughs> well i mean i amateur you know i because i mean part of uh, uh, of my workout routine for years was boxing because my trainer was a boxer and it's very it's it's all about the cardio right it's all about yeah. you know that whole thing um i guess my last question because it's something that you alluded to um, you know, a, a few questions ago about talking about, you know, being the tag team specialist you are and, and the opportunities that you had with tag teams and tag team wrestling, the Briscoes, and th we're going to throw FTR in there. We're going to throw yeah. the Young Bucks in there. I mean, there's, you know, the, you know, the acclaimed, you know, it, it's just, I feel like, do, do you have a feeling, well, I guess maybe this is a two-part question, that you're A, underutilized, and B, is there a sense of non-completion, meaning you weren't able to see that sort of vision through on a personal level? Um, as, a as far as the the vision, like I really felt like there was room in that AEW run for a Crockett Cup style um, pay-per-view. And Fucking I think- a tag team wrestling is so overlooked that i believe fans would have really enjoyed the difference the the um juxtaposition if you will that it would have been to have a, a tag team uh main event a tag team you know pretty much through like tournament um i think it would have been and I, I really feel like we had such a variety of teams when like the ones that you named and um there's there's more you know there's trent and um rocky trent and uh dustin whatever combination you want to put together with those guys um but i mean the, the list butcher on the blade yeah i mean it goes on and on um, i mean I, yeah I really felt like that was money kind of left on the table and it, it's unfortunate. So I do feel like that. Um, I would have liked to have seen that kind of uh, kind of come through a little bit better than it did. Um, but, you know, who knows, maybe another well, time. Well, I'll just say, you know, my favorite thing in the last probably 10, 15 years was the Cruiserweight Cup. You know, yeah. I love that, you know, and because that's like a specialized kind of thing. And how you said like a Crockett Cup. Yeah. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Money left on the table. I digress. Dennis, take us Undisputed off. podcast. I want to talk about this real quick while we wrap this up and give Please. you – Because first and foremost, holy cow, it's a very underrated podcast. It's a lot of chit-chat banter. You talk about MMA stuff. You have wrestling news. You you might be – and I was just telling Lars this before we hit record – it might be one of the few wrestling podcasts that has a pro wrestler talking about wrestling news and then having a fantasy draft on Halloween candy. It, it is, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is really eclectic. It's yeah. interesting. And how, how does it come about? Because we used to have PD Williams before he passed on to the company in the sky, Connecticut as a producer. <laughs> um, but but and it was like pulling teeth to get him and he was one of my best friends to come do a podcast and you yeah. know when you ask a wrestler to come do their pod do your podcast sometimes it's like uh, all right uh, who mm. Lars yeah I'll, I'll come do it because of him so yeah. how do you get roped into doing a fucking podcast I've wanted to do one uh for a long time and there was one years ago that i did with dalton castle and dalton and i were were very good friends and what i realized was that sometimes you shouldn't do such a thing with someone you're that tight with because <laughs> it just became like innocuous as all hell you know it did there was no difference between when he would just call me up and be like hey yeah you want to just come over tonight you know or it, it was it, we 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 lacked structure 
Um, this one, it's uh, two buddies of mine that I actually, we, we all went to the same high school, believe it or not. Um, and uh, we just reconnected at some point in our adulthood and, and it was discussed. And my, my buddy Frank is uh, a bit of a wrestling fan and, and Dennis um, as well. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about it and my, my buddy Dennis is, he's been a, a radio DJ for God knows, I, I don't know, as long as I've been wrestling, if not longer. And, um, so he was already occupying some of the podcast space and, and it, it seemed to just make sense. So we did the first couple and I feel like the combinations just kind of been getting better as we've gone, you know, we're getting a little bit better at it as we go. Um, and, uh, a little more structured and a little less, you know, just bullshitting and less innocuous, um, the guests have, I think, made a big difference too. Um, and those have come about, you know, um, in all sorts of places, um, which again, pro wrestling has allowed me certain um, access to things. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's given us some, some guests here and there that uh, I really didn't expect. And um the thing's getting better as we go. So I guess that's the, the most positive thing I can say about it, you know? Can I just say as the Dennis and Frank of this podcast, uh, <laughs> can you say their names? Because uh, I've had podcast guests in the host. I won't say anything on, you know, Eli Drake and Petey Williams, who does a uh, podcast. I, although Lars has mentioned my name. It'll be like, yeah, I do a podcast. Uh, it's wrestling perspective. I do it with uh, this other guy, and then they keep going. So, can you say <laughs> their names? So they, yes. so I know Dennis and Frank will listen later because they yes. support you. Just know Dennis and Frank, I got your back. Ah, uh, you do, you. sir. You do, sir. Uh, Dennis Remanowski, but he is better known to the world as D Scott. Like I said, he's been in radio for um a hundred years because Dennis is actually one hundred and twenty five years old. Um. Frank Ferraro is the other gentleman that does the. Oh, that's the a wrestling with. thing right there. <laughs> yes, it is right. He's got a hell of a Iron Sheik impression too. We'll have to uh, we'll have to parade that out on the next uh, episode. But uh, yeah, Frank Ferraro, Dennis Romanowski, two uh, two buddies of mine, and uh, that's that's the undisputed yeah. podcast. Frank Ferraro, the Kansas City jobber. <laughs> if, we, if you're not calling him fabulous Frank Ferraro on your next podcast, <laughs> you're leaving money on the table. You're you, you know equivalent of you know That's what I'm saying. Some promoter in the South would have called him Frank Ferrari. Oh, no. <laughs> ferocious Frank Ferrari. Oh my gosh, even better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, Bobby. You've spent enough time with us. You got to go be a dad, maintain the mustache. We appreciate yeah. every minute you spent with us. Uh, where can people find you on social media, real quick? Uh, at the Bobby Fish on Instagram and on uh, Twitter, the Undisputed Podcast with Bobby Fish. We are on YouTube. Um, we are potentially going to end up on uh, the premiere network with the podcast um, in the coming months. So um, look for us there. Uh, at the moment, the podcast is available on any and all platforms, whether it be Apple, uh, iHeartRadio, um, you know, all of them. Bobby, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Yes, sir. No, thank you. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Gentlemen, Lars, good to see you again, sir. Good to see you too, man. Yes, sir.